I love that line, you haven't failed me yet. And we talked with our, our students about that on Wednesday night. And we said, you know, why does it say yet? Like, is God ever going to fail you? Like, why didn't it just say, God, you, you never fail, you never will. And I, I, even saying yet at the end of that isn't to say, hey, at some point he will, as much as it is to say, I have a history that says he never has. And it's a reminder, and it's almost like you can imagine a father saying to a son or a mom saying to a son or daughter, hey, have I ever let you down? No, you haven't. You've never let me down. And so it's that same thought that we have a history. Like we, we have experience, and our experience can point back to that fact that God has never let us down. He hasn't let us down yet, and he won't. So today, like I said, we're back in Philippians chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 27 today. And I think verse 27 is one of those kind of high-pressure verses. I, I think about uh, people that I feel bad about, and one of the first, or bad for, and one of the first people that I thought I feel bad for is, is LeBron James. And you are probably like, LeBron James? How are you going to feel bad for LeBron James? Like, that man makes millions of dollars. He's got what he wants. Like, he's famous. Like, how do you feel bad for LeBron James? But y'all know, y'all know, how would you like to spend your whole professional career being compared to the greatest ever? You know what I mean? Like, like if there had been no Michael Jordan, how much different would LeBron James's life be right now? But LeBron does something great, and it's like, but is he Michael? It's, he breaks a scoring record, but is he Michael? He wins a championship, and it's like, but is he Michael? I mean, there's a lot to live up to in that expectation right? that comes with a weight. Hey, you, you, you and your basketball career will always be measured by another basketball career, and one that was not too shabby. And, and so, I, you know, I feel bad for him. I'm sure he's got money, but oh man, what a, what a sad thing to have your whole life as a professional be questioned that way. Well, here, Paul tells people to let their manner of life be worthy of the gospel. To me, that's almost like having Michael Jordan playing in the years before you get to the court. There's a lot of pressure in that. The good news is that Being Michael Jordan isn't like one of our goals. Being Christ is one of our goals. So measuring up to the gospel is a completely different standard that doesn't come with the disappointment and letdown and dissatisfaction that might come for LeBron James. But but let's get into the to the context here. In the last five verses, leading up to verse 27, Paul described his competing desires. One was to be with Jesus. He said, I want to be with Jesus. But he also wants to see the Philippians progress in their joy and faith. So he's struggling with these competing desires. And finally, Paul is like, I'd rather be with Jesus. But for now, Jesus has me with a purpose with you. And so I'm going to fulfill Jesus's purpose for me. So then we read verse 27, and it says, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. And that's just the first part of this. But Paul's making sure that if he's going to be faithful to them, they need to be faithful to Christ, right? So if if I'm going to put off the best thing of being with Christ, if I'm going to have to stay here with you guys, let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel. If my sacrifice is worthy of the gospel, let yours be worthy of the gospel. If Christ's sacrifice was so great, then what's yours? To be faithful in their manner of life is, is a pretty broad scope. I mean, it's, it's everything. Your manner of life is how you think and act at all times. So when Paul says, let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, it's everything. It's not let your time at church be that. It's not let your time with family be that. It's not let a certain time of the day be that. Let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel. And I really love how the CSB translates the Greek here. It's still the same idea. It's still the same meaning. But the the CSB translates the Greek still accurately but differently. It says, Just one thing. As citizens of heaven, live your life worthy of the gospel of Christ. Do you see the the subtle change there? That instead of manner of life, it's, it's citizens of heaven. There's again that kind of encapsulating theme there, that your manner of life is all of you. But now in in the CSB, the way that translates the Greek, it's also saying 
you're a citizen. Like, it's, it's a part of who you are. It's your, it's your birthright. I mean, this, who you are should be something worthy of the gospel. There's an impression of, of something deeper than surface level decisions as a citizen of heaven. Your life should be worthy of the gospel as a citizen of heaven is grounded in an eternal purpose, right? Your citizenship on earth is temporary. It, it, it doesn't last. But as a citizen of heaven, that's you forever. I mean, God has given you that title for, for, the, for the remainder. I mean, there, there's not even a remainder of days. For eternity. To recognize that your situation is temporary and hold steady in the gospel. When you, when you face emotional pain or physical harm or relational struggles, don't forget that you're a citizen of heaven and so live worthy of the gospel of Christ. Live outside of the petty games of pride and arrogance and comfort that citizens of sin and death play, right? As citizens of heaven, we're called to a different standard than the citizens of sin and death. Pride and arrogance, comfort, there's things we, we recognize the temporary nature of them. So we should live worthy of the higher, glorious call of the gospel. So verse 27 continues, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. So here's our first point. If you, if you picked up a service guide coming through, our first point today is striving in Christ. That's what we see here, striving in Christ. That living this life worthy of the gospel. And then Paul saying, so that. What's the reason for that? So that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of you, that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. So we, we're called to strive in Christ. So why does Paul command that they live as citizens of heaven? That they live in a manner worthy of the gospel? Because that manner of life produces the fruit that honors God. We learn from verse 27 that a manner of life worthy of the gospel brings, and if you're looking at verse 27, you'll see this. The manner of life worthy of the gospel brings steadfastness, right? Standing firm. It brings unity in, in one spirit. You see that? It bring, and one mind. And then it brings work, which is that striving. And it brings partnership, which is that side by side. So we see a type of life here that takes hard work and determination. Look, lazy Christians have to be one of the most disappointing things for God. I, I see verses like this, and there's a, it, there's, it's a call for us to be vigilant and, and, and hardworking. And as, as following Christ takes hard work, following Christ deserves hard work. Right? It, we, we not only say, hey, here's a command for it. We look at Christ and what he's done for us, and we go past, there's a command, and we say, he deserves that. Man, our... our discipline and our actions deserve to go towards a Christ who laid down his life for us, who suffered hard for us, who passionately lived every moment so that we could be saved. And, and I'm honestly apprehensive in, in using the word work in a sermon, right? We live in a context that so quickly leaves faith alone, right? Christ alone. We, we so quickly leave that to Christ and work. Or faith and do these things. So I, I, I hesitate to even say we need to be people who work for the gospel. So I want you to hear me loudly and clearly. The work we're talking about here is not salvific, right? This isn't the kind of work that brings you salvation. Christ is the only one who could have done and the only one who did that type of work. This is the work that follows salvation, right? This is the work that says, now that I am saved, now that I rest in the love of the Savior, now because I am loved, I obey. 
Because I lo- I'm loved and because I obey, now it requires action. It re- requires that kind of type of work. So your work doesn't earn you love from God. That's not what this is saying. Paul is not saying, hey, in order to be loved by God, in order to be saved by God, then work. It's not, that's not the call here. The love freely given to us creates in us a desire to work. That's the call we're seeing from Paul. So Paul is telling them, work and work hard at it. Stand firm together. Don't work alone. Work as a team. God has given you the church. He's given you each other. Remember, he's talking to the whole church of Philippi and he's saying he's given you each other to stand firm with one spirit, the spirit of Christ, with one mind, the mind of Christ. He's saying, don't don't be lazy. Don't get used to hiding in corners. Don't get used to to being in your bunkers. Keep, keep working hard. Don't say we've already attained the goal. And I don't know about you, but I, I find myself sometimes with a tendency towards complacency and, and laziness and, and, and a stillness. And I, I feel that in my spiritual life. I feel that in my, in just in being physical and, and sometimes when, when I feel that, especially physically, that I haven't been doing enough that I'm getting lazy. One of the things I like to do is go back and watch Rocky. Uh, and it's, y- y'all know, y- if, if you've ever seen Rocky, you understand. I mean, the man, all of his workout montages are awesome. But Rocky too is one of my favorites. And there's a scene where his wife just has a baby. And he says, he says, Adrian, like, have been thinking about what you said. I don't have to fight anymore. I can figure out something different. And Adrian looks back at him and she says, Rocky, there's just one thing I want from you. Win. And the bell starts ringing. And then it cuts to Mick over in the corner. And Mick's like, what are we waiting for? And then the next scene, you see, you see Rocky out on the hill. He's doing push-ups in the sunset. And I'm like, already right now, like, let's just go run some laps, guys. We're in the gym. Let's do it, right? I mean, there's this sense where I can't be lazy. I'm, this example is set before me of what it looks like to have a goal and work for that goal. He has one purpose and he lives for it. As Christians, we need to have that same intensity, that same focus. And we have Paul here saying, what are you waiting for? I mean, he, he's saying that you've got the goal ahead of you. You know what your cause is. It's the glory of God. Stop waiting. Go for it. A lot of times we fall into a pit of easy Christianity. But God's got more for you. He's got more for you than Rocky could have been sitting on his couch doing nothing, watching the six o'clock news, right? I mean, that would have been easy. God's got more for you. It feels good to surrender to his call and to strive in his service. This is a different striving than the striving for worldly success. This is the striving that says the victory's already won. I'm not proving myself. I'm not earning love. I am living within that love. I'm getting to enjoy Christ in my work. God has called you by name for his purpose, to labor for his call, for his cause. The question is, what's holding you back? I would say, not laziness, right? Because you're willing to stand firm and strive for the faith of the gospel, right? Because you've heard God's word and you've experienced the flood of joy from serving in the power of the Holy Spirit. You, you enjoy the work because you enjoy the object of your work. The object of your work is not some fleeting honor or or praise or trophy. The object of your work is the eternal God, the greatest treasure. And I believe that. I believe in this room, there's not a lot of you sitting in here that thinks, I just want to get by easy. I think, I think most of you want this. A lot of you are already working hard, and so this is the encouragement. Continue that. Keep working hard. Paul wants to hear that the Philippians are living for Christ. He says, so that I get to hear that. Whether I'm there or I'm absent, I want to hear that the Philippians are living for Christ with all their might, and that they're doing it together. There's a close connection between unity and and living worthy of the gospel. How do we stand firm? How do we strive for Christ? In one spirit, 
with one mind, side by side. Unity and partnership are essential to a life that honors Christ. Unity and partnership are essential to a life that honors Christ. We can't do it by ourselves. We can't be lone rangers in the Christian life. We have to be with others. Paul uses some of this same language back in Ephesians 4, which I'd like for us to read together. Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to start in verse 1. It says, Therefore, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. You see that similar language? I mean, it's like, he, it's like the same guy writing this. It's like the same God speaking through you all. This, right? Verse 2, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. In summary, like just looking back, what is he saying in those several verses? In summary, he's walking, he's saying walking in a manner worthy of the gospel means being unified with other believers under the lordship of Christ. If we're going to walk in a manner worthy of the gospel, we have to understand that we're under the same banner. We're not up here holding different banners for, for Christ. We're holding the same banner of Christ. That our work is pointed in the same way. We have one Lord, one master. That brings such unity to our work. And so as we walk in a manner worthy of the gospel, we walk together. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the Lord's work because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Where other labor might be, labor in the Lord is not in vain. Verse 28 says, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. So he's, hey, hey, live this way. Live standing firm in one mind, one spirit, striving side by side, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction. A heavy pressure, but a light load because God is good and he helps us in that striving, right? It's a different striving than the striving of the world. Here in verse 28, it's like, man, what a pickup. I mean, this is, to, this is one of the most emboldening verses in the Bible. We see here a courage in salvation. We see a courage in salvation. And don't be frightened in anything by your opponents. God cares about how you feel. Ben Shapiro is famous for saying that facts don't care about your feelings. But, but here we see a pretty clear example that God does. God does care about your feelings. He is invested in your courage. God wants his followers to not be frightened by anything or anyone. He wants the Philippians, and he wants you, he wants me to be courageous. And this is, this is always God's call to his people. I mean, this is, this is something that we can see in uh, Deuteronomy, in Joshua, in 1 Chronicles, in Psalms, in John, in 1 Corinthians. I could name more books. But look at this from Isaiah 43, verse 1. It says this, but now, thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. This is the tone we get from Paul. And not frightened in anything by your opponents. God who creates, God who forms, God who redeems also protects and saves he has called us by name, and the courage he gives is a clear sign of his providence. Right? When, when we live in the courage of our salvation, in the courage of our Savior, then the world sees and knows our supernatural courage is a clear sign of his supernatural strength. The enemy of sin and of demons and of our flesh and of those who are being used by all of those things— That enemy will know for sure that there is a God who is alive and able and ferocious and unbeatable and is certain of his purpose. 
nothing will stand in his way. Right? When they see the courage in salvation, they know there is a God behind that courage. We don't stand against the army of flesh on our own. We stand against the backdrop of a roaring lion surrounded by his mighty armies. Our enemies live in the dark. This is, this is just the truth. I mean, God is light. The enemies are in the dark and their eyes have become dim from being there so long. Imagine God uses you to stand courageously in front of an approaching enemy and he stands behind you and blinds them with his glorious light. Right? And that's the that moment where you open the shades and the light comes in and your eyes have to adjust. What do you realize when you see the courage? It's not about us, right? The courage, the courage doesn't point to us being great and mighty and awesome. The courage points to our God being great and mighty and awesome. And all those lost souls searching for what is true and where salvation comes from must see the contrast of the darkness cowering in front of the light. We see that our courage allows, God uses it, God uses our courage to show the light in the darkness. But all of that is lost when we're the ones lost in fear. When, when we, standing with God on our side, choose to live in fear, those who are looking for true life and true love will have no reason to see or know God, our true God, as the redeeming Savior. If he doesn't give courage to those who follow him, if we can't stand against oppression and harm and hurt, then what is the, who is the God that we serve? Who is the God that is the source of our strength? We betray our message. And Paul says that your courage from God is a clear sign of your salvation. This is your testimony. We write out our testimonies. Uh, it's one of the things that we want to encourage you is know how to talk about your testimony. Know how to tell people what God has done in your lives. We should use our words as we talk about our testimony. But our testimony is also our life day by day. This is, this is our testimony. Are you living fearlessly as one on mission from God or as one afraid without understanding? I mean, take courage in your salvation. Remember that God gave you life and rescued you from the worst thing that could ever happen to you. That's been done. He has not failed you yet. He's already, if you are a follower of Christ, saved you from the worst thing that could ever for all eternity happen to you. That's already been done. At this point, because of your salvation, what can anyone do to you? What worse? What worse could happen to you than that which you've already been saved from? Where are you cowering in front of the enemy and need to rely on the strength? I mean, here's the truth about the life that we live, right? Battle happens on multiple fronts, right? We, we know that, right? For some, the battle is in our family. For some, the battle is in our work. For some, the battle is on a screen. For some, the battle is in our past. Right? We have multiple fronts that we're fighting on. And it might be that you're standing strong and, and you're saying God is on our side on four of the five fronts in your life. But, but where are you cowering in, in, in fear? Where are you letting the enemy run over you? We can rely on the strength of God for our courage, for the sake of the gospel and the glory of our God. And we, we can do that. It's not our strength, it's God's strength. So, so why all this talk of courage and standing firm and living for Christ? I, I think this is, this is like the hammer uh, coming in verse 29 and 30, right? So we're talking about this courage, we're talking about standing firm. And then it says in verse 29, For it has been granted to you, that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. So in verses 29 and 30, gives us a reference point to really this whole chapter beforehand. Why, why are we talking about joy? Why are we talking about having courage? 
Why are we talking about standing together? What is the point of all of that? It's granted to you to suffer. We are granted to suffer. Paul is literally right here calling your suffering a blessing. Right? I mean, it, so if I'm reading this, I feel like these verses heading up to this are the encouraging verses. If, if there's struggles in my life, man, I need to rely on Christ. I need to work hard to overcome that relying on Christ, that my work's not what saved me, but Christ is what saved me. Man, what a blessing. What an encouragement to me. That's good. I can do this, right? That's how that feels. We can do this. God is with us. We can do this. And then it comes, this to me seems like the most sad, that, hey, all of this is because you're going to suffer. If I was writing this, I'd be like, watch out, guys. I'm sorry to tell you this. You're going to have to suffer. But Paul saying, it's a gift you've been giving. You've been granted to suffer. Suffering for the sake of Christ is a gift like belief is a gift. Right? We don't normally equate those things. Normally we think of belief as a gift. That's easy for us. Belief is absolutely a gift because for sure Jesus came and died for us. We're saved through belief. It's because of the way that he gives grace that we can have faith and believe that he died for us and rose again, right? In Acts, we see that. Even in the Gospels, we see the call to believe. That's salvation. So that, obviously, that's a gift. That's good. I'll take what I don't deserve. But suffering as a gift? It's a little harder. That's what Paul says. Not only belief, but suffering too. And he's not, and I want to be careful, he's not making the connection. Again, your suffering is not a work that saves you, right? It's not because belief is a gift and that saves you, that suffering also must be connected. But it's the fruit of it. The fruit of your belief is there is suffering. And Christians are weird with suffering. On, on one side, we're very quick to point to suffering as a, as a curse or as a sign of sin or punishment, right? I mean, it's like, oh, they're going through hard times. Like, you know, God, pray that God blesses them. It's like, maybe God is blessing them. We talked about that a few weeks ago. That's one side. On the other side, we elevate those who suffer for Christ and look at them as heroes with, with special calls on their lives from God to suffer. But really, neither of those viewpoints are, are completely biblical. You know, Paul couldn't be more clear that this is a part of the normal Christian life. Like, you're not a superhero Mother Teresa over here to have to suffer. Like, it's, it's, it's each of us. It's, it's the Christian life. This is the biblical viewpoint, that we're all called to it. Remember, Paul, if you go back to verse 1 of Philippians, Paul's not just writing to the pastors. He's not just writing to the deacons. He's, he's writing to the whole church. That, that's his goal here is for every Christian to hear this. It has been granted to you to suffer. He didn't address this letter to the superheroes or, or the, the weird world-rejecting pastors, right? I mean, he, he, didn't, he didn't do that. He, had, he addressed it to everyone. All of you are saved by grace. He's saying embrace it. Embrace that grace. Embrace the suffering from that grace as a gift from God. And not only embrace it, expect it. And not only expect it, enjoy it. Right? Paul has already discussed that, that, hey, I'm in prison and I'm thankful for it. It's actually a blessing to me. There's a joy even in the suffering. Paul makes sure they know that his suffering isn't anything new or isolated either, right? He's experienced and he's continuing to experience. You see that in verse 30, he's careful to say, I'm engaged in this. You already knew about it. You saw it, you heard it. And now you're hearing that I still have it. it it's been granted to you too, right? I'm here. You're about to experience it. You're in the middle of it now. And for Paul, it hasn't been just a short season of testing that God put him through. Right, we like to think of suffering as a short season. Like, you go through seasons of suffering, and then we're out of it. But for Paul, it wasn't a short season of testing. Suffering was a constant companion for Paul. And I was, I was, I was sitting in my, uh, my, so I make offices out of restaurants. Whatever restaurant I go to for lunch, I'll just stay there and make it a restaurant. I mean, make it an office space for the next three hours. Uh, yeah, so I get to know some of the... Uh, uh, people who take your orders. Um, but I was sitting there in this restaurant, and, and honestly, like, I, I shed a few tears thinking over this. 
Like, what does this, what does this mean? If, if I'm going to, if I'm going to make this if I'm going to internalize this, accept it as truth for my life, because the Bible is truth for my life. It's truth for your life. It, it really should make us want to cry a little bit. And, and, and really, like, I was, I was a little bit weepy, because this means that I have to work through the thought that God might and probably will call me to live through real and sustained anguished, anguish and heartache for the sake of the gospel. Right? Not, not a season of anguish, but that, like Paul, he might call me to a lifelong season, a lifelong pain. And, and even more than that, even worse than that, the thought of my, my sweet, innocent little boys someday suffering for the cause of Christ. Suffering at the hands of, of men who think themselves righteous, but are, but are truly evil. Right? Who, who, what if my boys are faithful? And, and it causes them suffering. It causes them torture. And what if I'm praying for that for my boys? Because isn't that the greater prayer for them? God, let them suffer for your cause. God, let me suffer for your cause. And that's not to say that we have to suffer, right? Like, I don't think that if you're, if you're not suffering right now, I'm not saying that you're in sin, right? I don't think that's the call here. But the call is absolutely for us to be ready for it, to not be running from it that our ultimate goal had better not be comfort in this life because man, it wasn't God's, comfort, uh, God's goal in this life, right? If, it, if Jesus' goal was comfort, man, we, would, we would not have salvation. And so we live, we have to understand the context God has put us into. We live in a context that glorifies and idolizes comfort. And in that, are we willing to separate ourselves from that idol And pray for suffering. Pray for the type of ministry, the type of the type of hurting and longing for the joy and 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 salvation of others that might put us out, that might make life hard for us. I have to change my mind to say I want that. Not that I want pain and hurt. I, I, I still I pray for I did last night, I pray for protection against that. But I want whatever expands God's kingdom more. And for whatever reason, God chooses suffering as a key method for making disciples. You know, not not for whatever reason. It's not for whatever reason. It's for our benefit that he chooses suffering. It wasn't wasn't a random choice for him to make suffering a part of how he shares. I mean, look at the history of the church. You can find all, all over examples of where... It takes the suffering of the church for there to be revival. It takes the loss of the people God calls children for the gospel to spread to those who are far from Christ. It's not for whatever reason. It's, it's for, the suffering is for our benefit and for our reliance. The suffering is, is so that we understand that our best thing is not comfort and nice cars and nice houses or they have the nicest phones, or even, I don't know, working TVs, or air conditioning, or running water, or a healthy body, or a functional family. Those aren't the best things. The best thing, our best thing, is closeness to Christ. Suffering teaches us our need for Christ. Christ. It teaches us our reliance that we can't make it better. But there is a better end than our temporary pain. Our best thing is to have hands and eyes on the treasure. And if God makes suffering a part of that, if God made suffering a part of that, then praise God. Praise God that he made a hard path to know him well. And who am I to say his methods aren't fair? We can find God's amazing plan for suffering throughout Scripture. But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. For our light and momentary troubles 
are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. I mean, even the example of Jesus, the prophecy of Jesus was that he was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. Whoever does not carry their cross and follow Jesus cannot be his disciple. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. But here's our joy. That in a prophecy of what is to come, it says, He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Our suffering is but for a time. And I recognize I I might not be preaching this sermon for, for you. I might not be preaching this sermon for your lifetime. I might not be preaching this sermon for the next six years. But maybe God is preparing us for a time of suffering. And it's not because people are getting more evil. Right? We don't have to look. We can look and we can find examples of evil in our culture. Right? We can, we can do that. And we can say, hey, it's getting more evil. I, I don't know. I don't know if it's getting more evil. It's just more exposed. I believe our suffering will come not from more evil, but because of more boldness. That suffering won't be because our culture is saying no more to us. They've always wanted to say no. Every culture has wanted to say no to being told that their way leads to death and destruction. But not every culture has bold Christians telling them that their way leads to death and destruction. And so maybe what today is for is not for your next 12 months. But maybe it's for what your boldness in the le- next 12 months leads to. But we have to be prepared for real suffering, physical suffering. You guys, we're already, you guys already know and experience the suffering of, of day-to-day life, of, of physical pain and of family pain, of relational pain, of, of loss and hurt. You get that. And maybe in, in ways God's preparing you for the pain of, of when the world rejects him by rejecting you. The hope is that. All of that is worth it. The pain is worth it. The, the push-ups on top of the hill at sunset is worth it because our goal is Christ. Our goal is the greatest treasure. He will wipe away every tear. That's what we live for. That's what we, that's what we pursue. Will you all pray with me? Father, we are thank, thankful for the gospel. We, we, we recognize that, that you died for us while we were still sinners. That you came to save us. God, yeah, we didn't deserve it. But we recognize what we've been saved from and what we've been saved to and we submit and surrender and accept, God, that, that whatever you give us, whatever task you put before us, whether it requires great suffering or little suffering, that we would work hard at it. That we would stand firm, that we would stand together in one spirit and one mind. That we would see the hardships that come as as blessings granted to us for your name, for your glory. God, we love you. Pray in your name. Amen.